Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and four shows as part of a week on Normandy. And one of the people we, we haven't ever talked about, and I can't believe it in 640 shows, we've never talked about the subject of today's show. He's come up in passing, but never dedicated a show to him. My guest, Brian Izzard, was a journalist for many years and has also penned several books, uh, Naval and History. And he joins us today to talk about the mastermind of Dunkirk and D-Day. And the links to that book are in the description below, as always. Just the usual housekeeping. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to click the button to subscribe. Don't forget to click the bell so you receive notifications. And as I say, all the information you need, social media links, book links are in that description below. That's your resource there. But without further ado, I'll bring Brian in. So good evening, Brian. How are you today? Good evening. I'm fine. Thank you. So... There are certain subjects that are perennial favorites for study and certain figures in World War II, perennial favorites, Montgomery, Churchill. I mean, how many, it's almost hourly Churchill biographies come out these days mm. and, and MacArthur and Patton, but Ramsey <clears> hadn't <throat> been really studied for quite some time. So my first question is why, why select Admiral Ramsey as a, as a, as a subject and, and why kind of now does he deserve a reevaluation? Uh, well, I got there by accident, really. Um, I happened to be in Dover um, one sunny day, <clears throat> and I could have taken a train back to London. But as you know, Dover has a splendid castle. And so I thought it was time to revisit the castle um, because I hadn't been there for many years. <clears throat> when I went in the grounds, I noticed there was quite a long queue and it was for the wartime tunnels, which hadn't been opened before when I was there. So I joined the queue, went on a guided tour, and towards the end of the tour, <clears throat> um, the guide explained that there wasn't very much on Admiral Ramsey, which surprised me because <clears throat> here were the tunnels where he carried out that marvelous operation Operation Dynamo, rescuing all those people from Dunkirk. Um, so it made me think, and I did a bit of research and found that there was only one reasonable biography, and that had appeared in the 1950s. Mm. So I thought perhaps, and of course, when I looked into his life, I realised that it wasn't just Dunkirk. Hmm. There were several other operations, um, the invasion of North Africa, the invasion of Sicily, <clears throat> and of course D-Day, where he played a major part. So I thought it was time to revalue his life. And um, I did, did some more checking and found that there wasn't very much out there published. So that's where I started. Well, it's a great response. And, and the thing is, you know, with all those major figures that we've talked about before, we've already name dropped them, the Churchills and the Montgomerys mm -hmm. and the MacArthurs. There was a lot of people penning memoirs, lots of pe lots of business creating these uh, incredible books about these people. But Ramsey, of course, doesn't survive the war to, to write his own memoir. And then somehow, for whatever reason, drops through the cracks. My, my personal interest, folks, in, in, in the Admiral is that he and I are both old boys of the Colchester Royal Grammar School. And I remember when I went to that school at 11 years old in the library, uh, all the portraits around the library, I didn't know who anybody was, except I knew who Admiral Ramsey was because I was already a bit of a D-Day buff by then. And um, he was, wasn't there for very long, only one term or one year or something. Or one year, I think, yes. Been claimed by the uh, Colchester Royal Grammar School as, as an old boy, and that's and that's interesting. So we've got some slides mm. and things to use to illustrate the, 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 the talk today. And well, folks... We'll do questions as we go along, but I'm interested in Brian's take on, on his command style, his staff, um, his abilities, and how he masterminds um, these various operations. And the vision, I, I like the fact you use the word vision in the book title, because when we look back, and we'll get to, to the Neptune and, and it's the, the, the incredible planning behind it later on, to be able to organize something that had never been done before, because that's what strikes me about Ramsey is that he's taking on things that hadn't been done before. Naval commanders have engaged enemy forces going back since navies first took the, the water, but overseeing operations on the scale that he did, it, it hadn't been done. So he's having to write the rule book as he goes along, which is extraordinary. 
So, but before, before we get into that, tell us about the young man. Tell us about his background and and, and who he was. Right. Um, <clears throat> he was born in um, 18, uh, uh, 1883. Um, <clears throat> his father was um, a cavalry officer um, who was uh, Scottish. But um, Ramsey's, mother, Ramsey's mother was Irish and he was actually born in a part of Surrey, which is now London. So a bit confusing, but he liked to think of himself as um, Scottish. Um, I think he learnt self-reliance from a very early age because um, at the age of 12, his father said, I'm off to India and uh, his mother went as well and he next saw them five years later so um <clears throat> he was looked after by um family and friends but he certainly had to develop a very strong desire for self-reliance so i think that put him in a good stead for uh, joining the Navy. He had a couple of brothers who went into the, uh, went into the army. They were older and by the time it came for Ramsey to have a career, it was decided that he would go into the Navy because it was cheaper. <laughs> um, so he went, he became a cadet at the age of um, 15 and here he is at um, the age of 20, um, sub-lieutenant. You notice, you notice how smartly dressed he is and he always um, put great emphasis on his appearance and he expected others to show that same kind of um, attention to detail. So that's Ramsey as a young man. <clears throat> Super. And often when we're talking about people of his generation, the, again, the Montgomery's, the First World mm. War was influential in both their lives and also their command style. So take us through his, his First World War and, and what you think he took from that that was to help him when he becomes what he becomes in 1940 and beyond. Well, actually, his first amphibious operation was um, before the First World War, um, when he took part in one of Britain's minor wars, uh, Somaliland, <clears throat> which um, was a landing from the sea. And that was his first experience. Very minor experience, but I think it, it stayed with him. Um, as for the First World War, even before then, he was developing, he had very strong ideas about the movements of fleets, um, <clears throat> which didn't always go down with his superiors. Um, and when the First World War came along, um, he clashed quite often with his senior officers. But even so, he, I, he was he was soon um, identified as an officer with great promise, um, and it was his attention to detail that was noted. He was all <clears throat> he was always smartly dressed. The ships he were in, he was in. He wanted them to look the best, um, and that's that's where he came from. As for the First World War. He didn't see um, a great deal of action, mm. but he got his he, he got his first command, which was a monitor, um, and then he became part of the um, Dover Patrol. Um, <clears throat> he was a destroyer captain, um, HMS Brook, and but whenever there were Whenever there was ma major action, he seemed to miss it. But he did learn a lot during that time. And of course, his um, being in the Dover Patrol, it gave him 
an excellent understanding of the coast of France, mm. which would later play um, a great part in future operations. No, absolutely, and it, it, it's it's the mastery also of of combined arms. It comes up on this channel a lot. Is that the people who who flourish in World War II are those who who understand all arms because it's all very well being a good traditional naval commander or a good mm. traditional tank commander, whatever it would be. But World War II is about all those forces acting together, and and everything mm. that Ramsey excelled at, as we'll get to later, Dynamo and and. and Husky and Torch and what have you. It's all about combined arms. It's, it's about the Navy working alongside the Army, working alongside the, the Air Force, and working alongside all the other bureaucrats and, and organizers. Because when you get to a position, we'll, we'll talk about his his retirement and his calling back to the to the to flag by Churchill, is it's working all those things together. So we're going to talk about later on his relationship with other commanders. Do you think the First World War shapes already? You said he had some some problems with higher ups, but also is being recognised. How good is he? Good at he was uh, was he at the diplomacy side of things? Because that is key to being a, a, high, a successful commander in World War Two at a high level. You've got to be able to get on with people across the board. And and was he was he did he acquire those skills early <clears throat> or did they come naturally? What's your take on that? I think he gritted his teeth quite often when he was. <laughs> Um, he was quite a forceful character in a in a in a quiet sort of way. Um, <clears throat> but what I should have mentioned before was that during his career, um, he placed great emphasis on efficiency. So efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. And if he found people not rising to his standards, um, <clears throat> then there could be trouble. And as I said, he quite often found himself at odds with um, senior officers. And well, we'll talk about his retirement because what the extraordinary about his career is is the whole of the Second World War could have just passed him by because he was he was not exactly young when we get to the late 1930s. He, he retires, but was it 1938 he retire, retires? Or, and then he is he is seen by Churchill. Uh, as being someone to bring back in out of the cold. So how did that all happen? Um, he didn't retire by choice. <clears throat> um, in 1935, he was a rear admiral. So he was rising, <clears throat> rising at quite a reasonable pace. Um, and he was offered the job of chief of staff to the then Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet. <clears throat> As I said before, Ramsey was um, very efficient and wanted to do his job perfectly. Um, but <clears throat> he found that um, when he took over as Chief of Staff, um, the Commander, um, Admiral Backhouse, um, was also very efficient and wanted to get involved with everything and <clears throat> they clashed and it ended up with Ramsey complaining that he couldn't do his job properly because the admiral <clears throat> um, the commander <clears throat> was trying to do his work as well he wanted he wanted to see everything and wanted to be involved in everything and would not let Ramsey get on with his job. So they clashed and it ended up with Ramsey in private calling the commander Mussolini. So, um, <clears throat> and after, after a while, um, Ramsey asked to be relieved of his post, which was virtually unheard of mm. in senior circles. And it didn't go down with the first sea lord. And <clears throat> Ramsey asked for another post. Um, he was offered um, a post in the in China, um, heading the ships in the in the Yangtze, which of course didn't appeal to me. Didn't appeal to him. Um, 
and it ended up with him being told there's nothing else for you <clears throat> um you'll have to retire so in 1938 he retired and of course the drums of war were sounding and he was called back um, and given the post of flag officer Dover. And what did Churchill see in him? Because it was Churchill, you know, pretty much brought him back in. And, um, did, well, I've I'd obviously met sure. him before. And Churchill is looking for particular qualities because he knows there's the, the threat of the war is looming, uh, mm. the, the Axis is a, is a big threat, the invasion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What what does what does what's Churchill looking for, and what 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 is it he sees in Ramsey? Well, I think I think it was actually the first Sea Lord who gave gave Ramsey the post because they realised that he was um, not someone who could just um, be discarded, especially at such a crucial time. Um, but Churchill did know did know Ramsey. And in fact, Churchill had been in Ramsey's father's cavalry regiment out in India. So, um, and Ramsey had actually gone to Churchill before the war and pointed out that perhaps the Navy was not in the greatest condition um, to fight the great growing threat from Germany. So, oh. so they did. They did know each other, and um, Churchill certainly endorsed um, Ramsey's um, new posting. So there he is. He finds himself in in Dover, and then, of course, nobody could have predicted even weeks before, certainly not months or years before, what was going to happen to the BEF in France. The mm. fact that there was an entire army going to be ch chased back to the French coast and, and have to be evacuated, that just wasn't in the wasn't in the thinking at all. There'd been a Singapore plan, I suppose, the other side of the world, but but this. So how, we, we, we take it for granted now, because we've all seen the movies, how successful Dynamo was, and, and, and so much credit falsely goes to the little ships which were part of it but it actually was the royal navy that did the, the majority of the, the the lifting off the, the beaches and the, and the mole and what have you and ramsey is known for them being the mastermind of this but in really looking at his career in, for the for the book and you know what what did he bring to it how what was his genius in putting that operation together was, was it was it organization was it teamwork was it his own ideas take us through how he puts that whole plan together in in your interpretation well, he had to. He had to do it very quickly. <clears throat> um, was it May twenty sixth, nineteen forty? Um, he virtually got a call from from the Admiralty <clears throat> saying, "I mean, he had known for a few days that this major crisis was de developing," <clears throat> and then. The, and they had made some plans before, but of course the immensity of the operation suddenly enveloped <clears throat> Ramsey and and his and his team. He was in the, as I mentioned, Dover Castle mm. has tunnels, and that was his headquarters. Um, and it was from there that he organised or supervised this whole operation but it he he had made a point of picking um very experienced and efficient people um and especially chief of staff um so they coordin coordinated everything and had to act, of course, very quickly. And you know, from your background as a journalist, you know, being involved with some big newspapers and editors and chief editors and, and newspaper owners, it's all about hierarchy and making sure everybody within that chain of command knows knows their their roles and their jobs. And mm. we've got an interesting question that I would have asked something very similar to that. Rob Crane is saying, if Ramsey had high standards, attention to detail, how well does he work with people beneath him? Was he good at delegating? De delegating? Or did he try to stay hands on? Because that is how I would have framed the question. Because something as complex as Dynam, he simply 
cannot be looking out in that map room for 24 hours a day during that entire procedure. He would have to delegate to other people to do things. He couldn't be there himself all the time. So his staff, his 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 organizing of it, is he hands-on? Does he delegate a bit of both? Kind of define where you think his, his, his skills are in this regard. He was very good at delegating, but he had chosen the right people in the first place. Right. So... And anyone who wasn't up to his high standards um, was out. So he was he was quite ruthless in that respect. So when Operation Dynamo began, um, he had a very good team around him. Super. And you know, it's it's his. You know, that's that's what seals his reputation with the public and and with with mm. with everybody in history today. Um, and we've got a photo, uh, you know, of him a uh, post Dynamo. But of course, that's not where his career ends. It goes on to great and great success. But mm. take it again, taking it forward to the next stages because he then goes off, and then we have Torch and with Husky. Do you, what what were the key things he's he's learned himself personally out of Dynamo? You said it yourself. Delegating is good. Having good staff there around you. Anything else that you think you know you could pinpoint as being that was the moment there that little that 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 particular incident there in Dynamo is what seals the deal in terms of his his his, his vision. You know, but I'm going back to the title of the book with the vision. Mm. Well, also he had very good, um, very good officers. Um, <clears throat> um, in charge of those ships that took part in Dynamo, um, especially the, the, um, the, the destroyer captains, mm. because most of the people brought back from France <coughs> came on destroyers, and the destroyers took heavy losses. Um, six were lost, I think, and something like 20-odd were badly damaged. So he was relying a lot on on his captains, um, destroyers, minesweepers, but also um, a lot of merchant ships took part in Dynamo. So he was relying on them, but obviously he couldn't exercise the amount of authority that he had with his um, Royal Navy captains. Super. So one of the photos you sent me is is Admiral Cunningham. So and you know we we didn't really mention Douglas Pound, uh, Pound earlier, but we could have done a Dudley Pound. Sorry, we, Cunningham is is another player in this in this area here. So how how does he fit into the story, and how does he fit into Ramsey's life and career? Well, he was um, commander in chief in the Mediterranean for quite a long time, and scourge of the Italians. But there was quite a lot of rivalry between. Ramsey and Cunningham, um, which began to develop when they um, drew up plans for the invasion of North, North Africa. Because originally, um, Ramsey was supposed to be in charge of the naval side of the invasion of North Africa. Um, but the Americans were not too keen on him because they thought um, Cunningham was um, a fighting admiral because he had <clears throat> he'd been highly de decorated in the First World War as a destroyer captain, which is a bit, a bit ironic because he saw lots of action and Ramsey, for various reasons, didn't. Mm. Um, so... Cunningham was was favoured. <clears throat> Originally, it was supposed to be Ramsey in charge, but then the Americans um, were very keen, telling Churchill that perhaps Cunningham was the best one to lead the operation. So <clears throat> Cunningham took over, and Ramsey was his deputy. And this is where, you know, this, we, we often talk about in this channel, the, the, the mid-war period, the 41, 42, even into 43 period, when the outcome is still not completely determined. It's we're over the major hurdles, but we're not there yet. And and so much of um, 
the public opinion is about seeming to be putting a, 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 a the war to the enemy. And as I understand at the time, you know, as you said that yourself, Cunningham mm -hmm. is seen as a fighting admiral, a, you know, a getting mm -hmm. out there, uh, pounding the enemy, taking warships out there. Whereas Ramsey, for what he was good at, was more the, or I'm not saying he wasn't the other stuff, but he was more of the organizing. And when we get to the joint operations and amphibious landings, it's the organizing qualities that really going to come to the fore. So I can understand there's a slight difference between their their um the roles and also what people saw in them and you know again so much of it is about the 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 relationship with the Americans. So it came up in a sidebar earlier because the Amer the relationship with the Americans is key because you have people like Admiral Kirk in the USA who really don't don't like the Brits at all. Um, and there's 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 general problems at some levels between the British and the Americans. So how does Ramsey get on with our with our uh, friends across the Atlantic generally? Um, well, going, just going back to Cunningham, um, yeah. you, you're quite right about Ramsey being the, the great organiser, and Cunningham acknowledged that he was um, he was really a big picture man, <clears throat> but it was Ramsey who made sure that everything worked, all the ships were in place. Um, Cunningham was more of the uh, more of a diplomat, I think. So just let let Ramsey get on with the organising. So yeah. you know, we, 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 with the focus of the day is really we're going to get to Neptune and, and, and Normandy in, in in a moment there, mm -hmm. but we can't we can't move on without talking about um, yeah, again we've just touched on it, but Torch and Husky, so North Africa and Sicily because mm -hmm. they are integral in everything that the Allies are doing, heading towards the eventual second front into into europe which we know of course was in france but mm. your takeaways from his uh role in in north africa and and the mediterranean and sicily generally again you know the dynamo was was a relief operation it was a rescue operation but now we're on the offensive now how does he transition uh ramsey and his leadership style from from being even though it's still organizing it's now uh, motion towards as opposed to more motion away if you compare dynamo to, to the, the next operation so what skill does he does he develop out in north africa and, and mediterranean and, and how does he use them when, for planning towards uh, what became normandy well he had to he had the um <clears throat> difficult job of not all organizing one fleet but two fleets because the americans were with the invasion of North Africa, <clears throat> the Americans were playing a big part for the first time. Um, so it was coordinating American warships and British warships. And of course, there were three um, invasion points, main invasion points for North Africa. So <clears throat> there was a lot of um, juggling and that, and that was down to Ramsey's organization. And of course, they, have, they did have a problems with landing craft um, <clears throat> and also getting the crews experienced enough to land because some of the seas were quite rough in um, North Africa. And at this point, just to, to, before we move on to Neptune, we had a great question from Madcat352 saying, during this period, are there any stories about Admiral Ramsey that stand out, you know, funny ones or, or, or indicative of, of his leadership style or anything that, you know, you discovered that went, that's a cool story from this period? Um, there, was, there was one thing that struck me earlier on in his career <clears throat> when he was out in China. Um, he insisted that junior officers were fully dressed in uniform and or even when they were wearing civilian clothes that they had a hat because he said otherwise they couldn't salute him properly so he was a stickler for appearance and making sure that everything was correct Brilliant stuff. So let's we'll move on to towards Neptune because that you know it is Normandy week here on, on World War Two TV, and, and this is where, as someone who lives in Normandy, I, I see his organisation there because it is the 
everyone calls it, you know, the biggest amphibious landing of all time. There are so many moving parts. It's extraordinary. Everything from the smallest LCAs up to, to the, to the massive great, um, you know, mm. battleships and what have you. So, how how do you begin when you know when Ramsey was given command of the 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 naval element of it, and you've got essentially a metaphorical but probably a, a literal bit of blank paper ahead of you to do this. Okay, they've got they've got the experience of Husky and Torch, but th- this is this is the big one. This is the FA Cup final. If you're an admiral there, you know, take us through the process of starting and building the operation because people like Morgan and Cossack who'd worked out the actual how they're going to attack. Uh, and, and make a landing hadn't worked out the details of it, the actual how you're going to get all these ships and, and craft from different uh, ports and different places to one place. How, how does how does someone like how does someone begin a task like that? Again, is it about staff and appointing the right people? Well, it it did it did start much earlier. Um, in fact, planning was going on when they were already invading Sicily. Yeah, so there was staff. <clears throat> And uh, of course, the Americans pretty earlier on had wanted an invasion of Europe. Um, and Stalin did also, he wanted a diversion. Um, so the, there was lots of planning going on before um, 1944. Um, and, and there was quite a lot of details being worked out, even when um, Ramsey was engaged in the invasion of Sicily, mm. and and you mentioned you mentioned something interesting there about the fact that the Americans and indeed pressure from the Russians to get things started earlier. If mm. anybody understands how many moving parts there are going to be needed for this operation, it's someone like Ramsey. And I've, obviously, you know, we're, we're we're talking to people who know this already. You cannot mount an operation of that size until you've got enough of the landing craft, the landing ships. And if mm-hmm. Stephen Fisher was here with us, one of our regular guests and viewers, you know, LCTs particularly, you know, without them, without you, know, you just simply cannot get a landing force over there. So does does Ramsey have a good grip on just what is needed from bottom up? Because you know it's it, it can sometimes commanders are accused of only knowing the big pic, you know the big picture, but they mm. don't know that bottom end. Did he go and visit all the, you know, the, the, the 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 various elements that would make up this amphibious force? Does he does he does he converse with landing craft experts and and supply experts, logistic experts? How how does his um, preparation take place? Well, you're quite quite right about the scale of the, <clears throat> of the operation there. We're talking about something like 6,000 vessels. Mm. So, and, and landing craft were key. Um, there was a massive um, operation going on in shipyards around the country, producing ships. And ships were coming, <clears throat> coming across from the, <clears throat> the United States also. Um, but as I said, there was a lot of planning going on before, and Ramsey was quite cautious. Rather than have fewer ships, he wanted more. So he was always um, sort of adding to the number. But it's quite remarkable that they could, he could produce this fleet in quite a quite a small area i mean the channel mm. 6000 vessels um and of course as your map shows um when the actual invasion took place um they had to develop various channels um minefields were a massive problem which had to be solved um before the attack began um yeah, just a huge, enormous operation, <clears throat> and of course, and, any, and of course, um, the, va- the invasion area actually increased because Montgom- Montgomery insisted on having five divisions rather than three. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, that meant more ships, um, bigger well, controls. Well, that- that question came in from Rob Crane is, is is how did Ramsey react when they heard that they wanted five rather than three? Because it's all very well saying 
yes, we're going to have five now. But as you said yourself a minute ago, you've got to provide the resources for that. And, you know, you said there that he's, it, it, it's for, for, to, in this kind of role, organizing something that big, it's that balance mm. between caution and understanding what is possible, but also ambition to get something like this off the ground. And, and I, it seems to me that he's very good at balancing it between, you know, playing it safe, but also understanding that, that an invasion of enemy coast is something of a gamble, but you've mm. got to have all your assets in place to, to reduce the risk of, of that gamble um, uh, failing. So, you know, th 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 do we have any idea about what his reaction was when the beach head got expanded? Well, actually, he agreed with Montgomery. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, their relationship was quite interesting. <clears throat> they were complete opposites in character. Um, and but but Ramsey did did like Montgomery. He thought he was a, an excellent commander. Um, and of course, Montgomery and um, Ramsey agreed quite a lot on tactics. And the plans that, that, that had been developed for Dida, they were changing quite a lot. And <clears throat> Ramsey certainly backed Montgomery when he said, um, about the need for five divisions. And he was quite, he didn't complain about, well, we have to have more ships covering those areas. Uh, we need more firepower. Um, he was in agreement. So you said he had a, work, a, good, a good working relationship with Montgomery, although they're opposites. Of course, the other figure we've got to bring into the story is Eisenhower as well, because... Mm. One of the things I always, not patronizingly, but I correct people when I, when people say that Eisenhower planned uh, Overlord. No, he oversaw it. He supervised it. But you know, as mm. you said yourself, a lot of the planning was already in place before Eisenhower joins joins as the commander. But how does Eisenhower get on with Ramsey? Because Eisenhower is genuinely very good at getting on with everybody. But I don't think when we're talking about Eisenhower's relationships with people Ramsey ever comes up into people's thinking we talk about Eisenhower and Patton and Eisenhower and Montgomery and Eisenhower and Bradley mm -hmm. but is is their relationship not talked about because there wasn't much to talk about they just got on pretty well and that was it or is it because there was something to talk about but no one talks about it does that make sense <laughs> um <laughs> no that they, they they did get on quite well although Ramsey later in the campaign Normandy campaign <clears throat> he did have doubts about um, Eisenhower's ability to um, continue as su supreme commander, um, but they they got on quite well. They were they were similar in a way because um, Eisenhower didn't have great battle experience before mm -hmm. the Second World War. Um, he was actually a lieutenant colonel in the Philippines, I think. Um, <clears throat> when war broke out, but he was highly regarded by General Marshall, and he was promoted very quickly. Um, so, in a, in one way, Eisenhower and Ramsey were similar, and they were not as colourful as someone like Montgomery, who quite likes the adulation and mm. the publicity and so on. So we've got a good question about how Admiral Ramsey gets on with the American Navy, because you said again yourself there that Ramsey, like Eisenhower, hasn't really got that much practical experience, practical experience of, of large scale naval operation. Now the Americans, mm. even by 90, even by, by Husky in Sicily, but certainly by, by, by 44, they've got huge amounts of experience of battling uh, at sea in World War Two. Okay, we're talking about the Pacific, and and mm. and, and and but they, they they have been doing a extended naval campaign for for two good years now. So that's one of the subject that comes up a lot is that is how much do do you bring from the Pacific to the ETO, and how much do you take from the ETO to visit? Because they're they they are different wars, they are different problems, different different requirements, different needs there. But the American Navy have got experience. So when and you said earlier how they are becoming this gradually becoming the senior partner in this. Whereas if we go back to Dynamo, Ramsey's the top dog there. Yeah, you know, this is an entirely 
Royal Naval organized operation, albeit there's French, Belgian, but Danish, but it's it's from a top down, it's Royal Navy. Now it's combined, it's everybody, it's 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 the it's so how does he get on with Americans who are coming in with ideas, but maybe from uh, the other theaters that perhaps don't align with what Ramsey wants for what is gonna be the, the the second front here in Europe? How does that relationship work out? Well, Ram Ramsey was the top man, yeah. <clears throat> naval man, so um, he was senior. Um, but going back to, about the experience of the Americans, the, the people right at the top of the American command, um, people like General Marshall and Admiral King, <clears throat> they didn't have a lot of battle experience. They were very senior when the Second World War broke out. Um, so it was the people who were actually doing the fighting mm. in the Pacific and in those European campaigns who had the experience. I think generally um, Ramsey got on quite well with, um, with the American naval, senior naval officers. <clears throat> Although he did, he did complain about some of them. <laughs> Um, if you want, I mean, we had a question about what what you said earlier about that. Um, he had some some doubts about Eisenhower's handling of the Normandy campaign, and, and you say, just said there that there were some worries. Yeah, do you want to share what some of his worries were? Did he did he write them down? Did he tell other people about them? What what were his worries about about other people generally? Because you said earlier on that he 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 has very high standards around him. And I assume mm. it's not just high standards; it's it's his version of high standards. Because as we know, with these type of commanders. You could have two good commanders with both high standards, but they're different types of stand. They're standards in you know some people like their maps and their preparation, and their charts and their data. Some people they like their combat commanders. So, with with all these personalities, what what doubts may have he have had about some of the others? Um, he didn't find them as as efficient as he might have liked. <clears throat> Was it Admiral Kirk, I think, who was on the, um, <clears throat> was one of the senior American mm -hmm. commanders. And he found that he complained quite a lot and was over anxious about some of the threats to um, the American Navy in the, in the channel. But um, as far as I, Eisenhower is concerned, I think it was, it was later on when Eisenhower was um, <clears throat> um, sidelined by Montgomery over um, Arnhem. Instead mm. of attacking or trying to make the best use of Antwerp, um, I think that's where a lot of doubt came in. Well, it's funny you should mention that because we had a couple of people asking about Antwerp and the Scheldt Estuary. Uh, Norma Graham, one of our Canadian viewers, who's who's ne never misses the opportunity to mention the Scheldt Estuary and because Canada's role in that. I mean, I know we're skipping way, way away from from Normy now, but you, but you started it by mentioning Antwerp before I did. But Ramsey, when it comes to later on in the war and, and the Scheldt Estuary, anything about you know you, you said yourself, you know, he's starting to have doubts about how things are being organised. Was that a low spot for him? Uh, that sort of September October period when, mm. when it, it, if you were looking at, at Ramsey's career like as a kind of a in a football football terms that would be the, the 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 season where he didn't win a cup wouldn't it be that september october period? because it was for allies generally the whole shell estuary antwerp saga is is not good but how, what were ramsey's thoughts about it in, in more detail well i think he was he was quite annoyed because the port of antwerp was actually captured and it was one of the few ports that was virtually catch, captured intact because the Germans had a habit of <clears throat> destroying ports when they um, departed. Um, and the, here was this great, great port, which could have been, could have been a great use of use in, you know, continuing the campaign into Germany. Um, and they couldn't use it because um, they couldn't get through the estuary mm -hmm. because of the fortifications. And because of the 
diversion of Margaret Garden, the, um, the attack on Arnhem, um, which proved so costly, it took away a lot of resources and time when they could have been moving more directly and had not had they not listened to um, Montgomery who thought this was a great shortcut mm. um, and they re <coughs> and Ramsey realized quite early on that a mistake had been made. No, fascinating stuff. And the other thing I want to bring on now is, as we'll go back to Neptune and Normandy Norm in a minute, is again referencing your career as a journalist. I mean, high stress, lots of lots of burnouts, lots of people who who disappear or, or or have a career change. And we talk often about the the PTSD by you know infantry on the ground and tank commanders and people like that. But Ramsey has now by by forty four, he's been at the sharp end with a lot of organisations since nineteen forty. Uh, it was just World War II alone, not counting his previous career. Reading, you know, as you've done the research into, into him as a human being, is, mm. is is it all taking a toll on him by 1944? Is he, is he, you know, has he got a reserve of strength to keep using? Because, you know, he has been burning the candle at both ends in all this organising for a long time. Where's your assessment of his kind of, it's a modern way of asking it, but his kind of mental health when you look at the middle part of 44, for example? He, he was certainly looking forward to the end of the war. Um and he was hoping that when the war ended, his career would end as well. <laughs> mm. um, because as you, as you say, he had been under a lot of stress. Four major operations, um, he'd been a key player. But also I think that his um, time in retirement after he was forced to leave the Navy and then being recalled back at the beginning of the um, Second World War. I think that was good for him because um, he went off to his house in the country with his family um, <clears throat> and he had a year, 18 months, when he could just relax. Um, he enjoyed country pursuits. So I think that gave him a lot of energy when the war started and that carried him through. But he was certainly under immense pressure from 1940 onwards. And he was certainly looking forward to the end of the war. And he, was, he had actually hoped that the war would end at the beginning of 1945, because he had a bet with Montgomery, five pounds, that the war would end at the beginning of 1945. Oh. And I'd, I'd forgotten that one thinking about, it, but now you remember. I do remember that one there. Yeah, that's that. And that's, and that's, he had and to cough up the five pounds to Montgomery. And that that is actually quite um, quite a, uh, an indicator of their relationship because you don't make those kind of kind of bets with people you absolutely hate. Well, maybe you do, but I mean, I think it suggests that that they do get on. And I think we're in an era where we're always talking about commanders who don't get on. That's what sells books is this guy didn't like this mm. guy and this guy absolutely hated that guy and the whole, you know, the, the Patton Montgomery thing that gets out of hand at times. I think talking about people who genuinely get on with most people isn't as sexy, but actually it's probably the majority of the officers who went through World War II were team players. They did get on with people because in adversity you, you have to. But, but going back to, to, to the Normandy campaign, and again, you know, your your new, your newest your, all this research you did for the book there, and you know, there hadn't been a book <clears> since the nineteen fifties. I can certainly say in all my shelves of nominee reading, Ramsey doesn't get as much credit and his staff don't get as much credit as they do. So often D Day books start with first boots on the ground. They start with paratroopers jumping out of the aircraft, all those landing craft hitting the hitting the beaches there. And that whole organization the mine sweeping the organizing logistics just getting all those ships in order out of all those harbors getting them into the right forces getting them across the channel and having them all arrive at the right place in the right order and of course we know there were teething problems we know it didn't work 100 percent perfectly and there were some assessments of tides and landings that were that could have been improved but Basically, it was 98% successful. So do you think, as, as someone who's investigated Ramsey, his part in organising has been um, rather over, uh, overlooked over the years? It certainly has, yes. Um, because a lot of people think <clears throat> D-Day 
Operation Overlord, and, and that was it. But without Neptune, there wouldn't have been the landings. So the, <clears throat> the invasion force um, owed a lot to the men who took them over, all those, all those ships, and, and also the preparation. Um, there was a massive bombing campaign um, by the Royal Air Force, um, <clears throat> the American Air Force. Um, there was a huge sea bombardment before before the invasion. So there were lots of different strands to the to D Day, and um, and I'm one of Sorry, I'll just interrupt there. I just want to throw out these images while we've got them on screen. I put these together, you know, just showing that this is the kind of information that was mostly provided by the Navy. This is the shore batteries in Normandy that were going to be uh, overlooking the fleet coming in, and the, all those circles are the are the arcs of fire. Uh, and this, if you you know, you look at the documentation. This is supplied mostly by the Navy people. This isn't supplied by the Army. This is a, this the Navy put this stuff together. The mm. Navy put this kind of thing together, showing how the the this is I think it's Gold Beach or Juno. This one with the LCVPs, the LCAs, the LCTs, the the, the artillery vessels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all coming together someone has had to organize all this someone has had to do all this in advance and i'm not just someone hundreds and hundreds of people so it's not mm. just about ramsey himself it's about ramsey's staff that put together neptune because you know again we overlord is used as the all-encompassing in fact we use d-day as the all-encompassing word now which we don't use we use overlord less and we use Nep neptune even less but mm. to me neptune is is incredible so again some of the thing, any particular things you think that was Ramsey's input there? Anything that you think he made sure we did this? Any little key moments of Admiral Ramsey's uh, input? Well, there's one thing that struck me. I mean, he he was, um, as I've sort of mentioned, attention to detail. Um, it was that was crucial in his thinking. <clears throat> And some of those ships got um, before before they set off um, for the invasion. They got um, orders which ran into hundreds of pages, which they had to which they had to assimilate. And of course, you had to coordinate all these ships from different ports. So it's remarkable that there weren't that many collisions, and they were all able to assemble in the right channels. Um, staggering operation, yeah. Absolutely, and, and you know, it just came up in the question there. Of course, because he, you know, and I'll, 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 for those who don't know, I'll have you explain why he doesn't see out the war. Uh, but do you think he would have been the kind of person to have written a memoir had he not died, or, or was he the sort of person to let his actions speak for themselves and just go, go into, as you say, he wanted the water over, he wanted to go back and and and, and to, to peace? Would he have written? Would he have written a memoir and done the chat show circuit? Would he have been a guest on World War Two TV? Um, he disliked personal publicity, and his idea of um what he hated was um, being photographed or having to explain things. Um, he didn't like he didn't like publicity at all. Um, I think he would have had he survived the war um, and it's tragic that he died shortly before it ended. Um, I, th I think he would have retreated to his country home with his family and just enjoyed a much quieter life doing country pursuits mm. and that kind of thing. But I think maybe years down the line, he might have been tempted to, um, to write his memoirs, um, especially after seeing what people like Churchill and Montgomery had written about the war. I think he might have thought that some balance was needed. Well, that makes sense because it, some of those people we mentioned when they wrote their books weren't necessarily the, the most enthusiastic about 
celebrating the 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 other people's achievements they were a bit i did this i did this i did this and again i think that's one of the reasons why my ramsey's story is a little bit less well known is that the others didn't particularly include him in their versions they kind of i'm not saying they took credit for what he did they just kind of tended to ignore what he did but just just explain to him what what you know his tragic death because some people watching may not know Right, uh, January the 2nd, 1945, <clears throat> um, Ramsey had to fly to Brussels for a meeting uh, with Montgomery about the next stages of the war. Um, he boarded a plane at an airfield near Paris. Um, it was a Hudson plane uh, with his personal pilot um, the plane took off that morning, barely got airborne, <clears throat> banked to the left and crashed, um, killing Ramsey and all on board. Yeah, no tragic. Um, so we'll, we've, we've done a bit of a chat. We've got a few questions from people that I will, we'll put them in there. Ian Carr is asking, um, is there a good archive of Ramsey's work? So I'll extend that to, you know, do, when you are doing the book, are there, are there diaries? Is there correspondence? Is there much to get your teeth into? Or did you have to rely on other people's accounts or both? Um, no, there's quite a good archive at the um, Churchill College. Um, Ramsey was, um, he kept diaries, which were quite detailed. And he wrote a great deal to his wife. Um, during the war. So there was a lot of material there, apart from his official reports. Mm. Now, thanks for that. And, you know, you just thought about the fact, you know, writing to his wife. Um, we're in an era where we feel we need to know about the commanders now, and it's not just about their prowess on the battlefield. And people, you know, it came up with the SAS show recently about whether or not Blair Maine is homosexual or not. And people are obsessed about things that perhaps they have no reason to, to, to know about. Um, and we've talked about Ramsey as a, as a, as an incredible planner of these, these four major operations, but as a human being, you know, as a family man, as a, as a, as a husband, you know, what's your assessment of him as a person? Uh, you know, the kind of guy you'd like to have a, have a beer with in a pub and a generally all round good egg or, or, or complicated? Because a lot of leaders <laughs> are complicated, aren't they? Montgomery clearly was pretty complicated. But Ramsey, a pub, a, a beer with him in a pub or not? Yeah, your no, name from Brian. <laughs> I don't think so. No, no. He was quite a private person and he didn't, right. he didn't mix easily um, socially. Um, and he, I think he liked to keep his distance because he felt he was in a certain position of authority and it wouldn't be, <clears throat> it might undermine him if he thought he was mixing too much. Um, but he did, he did throw the occasional party. Okay. Um, but, but certainly not one to say, you know, let's have a beer. Okay, thank you. Well, one, we'll do one more question, and we'll bring things in. So Robert is asking, you know, we talked about the Schultz situation, and this is a good, a good question, Jenny, is, you know, when you talked about those four big operations, were there any other big things planned or considered that never happened later on? I mean, was there any big things? Because we talk about the various cancelled operations between between Overlords and Market Gardener, for example. Were there any mm. other big things that Ramsey might have been involved in, but for whatever reason didn't happen? No, I think Antwerp was the last big operation that he was involved in. and. Um, Quite a lot of that was delegated anyway um, from his part. But also uh, what hasn't been mentioned is that um, one of his key roles um, with, his, with his team was getting all these supplies across the channel. Mm. Um, it wasn't just on detail. A massive amount of material was being <clears throat> shipped over and that continued right up until that was still going on when he died i mean and that's what and that's yeah you know, but i said we'd, we'd stop but it is worth expand uh, expanding on because um we talk about um dynamo being something that he had to do pretty suddenly um and and the the, uh, the unloading 
post D Day, so D Day plus one, two, and, and, and on and onwards, was hampered by the massive great storm that hit for four or five days, a couple of weeks in, and the Mulberry Harbors were behind. Is there a moment, you know, you said earlier that there was a moment when Ramsey was concerned about Eisenhower's uh, handling of this. Were there any moments where he thought, oh my God, it was it's all going a bit pear-shaped? Because there is that period a couple of weeks in with the storm and mm. things have slowed down a bit. The advances haven't been quite as hoped. Uh, there's a there's a real need for logistics. Was there, was there a dark moment there when it looked like it might have unraveled? Did, did he ever talk about that? Um, well, he had he'd made sure that there was an organization which could step in <clears throat> um, a repair organization so they moved um quite smith uh, quite swiftly after that great storm mm. and there were a huge number of landing craft which had been damaged um but and ships um but they moved quickly and got a lot of repairs done and that's worth mentioning because you know you said this attention to detail. That's one of the things when I look at that mm. that uh, the Neptune plan. It's all it, there's always, if you like, a plan B and a plan C. That the eggs have not always been put in one basket. There is depth to that plan. There is mm. there is allowance for it might not work as well here. If so, we'll do that. There's contingency in it. I mean, you, one could argue that the Mulberry Harbors themselves are a big insurance policy as opposed to being absolutely intention, vital in their own right. They're part of a whole complex of things. And I think there's a lot of Ramsey in the complexity and, if you like, the, the, the backups in that plan. Is that something you'd agree with? Certainly, yeah, yes. I mean, it's lucky they had two harbours um, because yeah. the, the great storm put one completely out of action. So they were able to use the other one at uh, Aramanche. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> and that's, um, yeah, they still managed to get huge supplies across. Well, we got one, we'll do one final question, which may or may not, you may or may not have an answer to it. Sean Bannon is asking, is there an innovation or what innovation in the Neptune plan that is entirely Ramsey, not part of previous planning or forced by something else? Is there one thing you can go, yep, yeah, that was the Ramsey input? Um, perhaps those harbours, um, right. Pluto pipeline. Um, yep, just the the huge um, scale of, of things. And um, I think one of the crucial things was the his care with the minesweeping operation before D-Day. No, that's worth it. And we, we did a show with um, Nick Stanley all about a year ago now about the mine sweeping. And, you know, it, it, it was possibly one of the most complex shows we've ever done. I mean, it was great, but... The, the sequence of events that had to be carried out by all those types of vessels. And, and Nick, I'm sure I'm pretty certain mentioned Ramsey's input in that. And that's something again, that we is an overlooked aspect. We talk about, as I said, this arrival of troops on the beaches and men jumping out of aircraft. And we, we tend to overlook the complexity of the previous 24 hours, 48 hours. And indeed, as you said, their previous effectively two years there, but, Brilliant stuff. My, my final question is about the book now. I mean, it's it's, it's not out. It's been out a while now. It's you're, you're not. It's not imminent. But what were your hopes for it, or what are your hopes for it? Obviously, you want people to read it who've got an interest in naval history and biographies generally. But is there a particular thing you hoped it would do? The book. Uh, just um, get Ramsey's name to a bigger audience. I think. Um, yeah, I'm I'm surprised that more hasn't been done about him um and hopefully the book will play a small part in changing that <laughs> well definitely i mean yeah again it's he's he's i think it's myself i mean i've been studying and living in normally for 25 years nearly 25 years now i think if i don't check myself when i'm naming the people who are key about the planning i don't think ramsey would be in my top 10 unless i would think particularly to make sure he's in my top 10 and i think that mm. is part of the fact he's for whatever reason, his name just isn't in that first rank of people. He, he he was somewhat unassuming. He didn't like the publicity. And I think 
it's a shame really that he isn't better known but then as i say your your book will be doing something to, to do that and this show will have have a little part as well so well it's been great talking to you brian i can't wait for you to come back on again when you do it you've done the yangtze incident but that's post-war i can't deal with that but if you do another world war ii book you're welcome to come back and talk about that so i'm going to take you off screen for a second to remind you what you are coming tomorrow and i'll bring you back in a second to say goodbye folks tomorrow evening uh we're talking about the lacombe german cemetery i've been looking forward to this show for a long time alexander brown is a german historian and tour guide friend of mine and for years and years, I wanted to know exactly all the details of why the Germans do things the way they did, how the graves are set up, what the history of that cemetery was. And that will be a really good show. If you ever bring groups to Normandy or have been to Normandy, it will tell you everything you want to know about the Lacombe German Cemetery and more. So that's tomorrow. But right now, I'm going to bring Brian back in just to say good evening and thank you. And uh, folks, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you for watching. Thank you. I'll see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. All Bye. Right.